Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Simone Cavallaro, director of the Steel Center. Before we start, I would like to express our gratitude once again to the healthcare workers on the front lines of the pandemic, both in the US and abroad. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning in today for the first webinar in our new series, The Political Economy of COVID-19. At these uncertain times, there is a need for reliable and trustworthy information. To address this demand by both students, alumni, faculty, the university, and greater community, the Stiger Center has developed this new series of online programming to explore the global economic and political implications of COVID-19 with leading academics and experts. Today, we are happy to host Professors Angus Deaton and Luigi Zingales for a conversation on Professor Deaton's book, co-authored with Anne Case, Death of Despair and the Future of Capitalism, as well as COVID-19 crisis and the US healthcare system. The book is available for purchase online from our campus bookstore partner, the Seminary, Seminary Co-op. If you're interested, you can find the link in the event description. Before we begin, please note, we're on the record and live streaming to the Steel Center YouTube channel. Please feel free to share the broadcast on your social media. If you have a question for the speakers, please submit it via Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. The last 15 minutes of, your, of, our, of the webinar will be devoted to answer those questions. As usual, views expressed by our guests are their own, not those of the Stiegel Center or the University of Chicago. As you may know, the Stiegel Center promotes and diffuses research on regulatory capture and the various distortions that special interest groups impose on capitalism. We have many initiatives to help both students, alumni, faculty, and the greater community stay connected and informed in this difficult period, including weekly episodes of our podcast, Capital Isn't, co-hosted by Luigi Tingales and Kate Waldock, focused on coronavirus and its economic implications. New coronavirus and COVID economy sections in our online publication, promarket.org. And more coming webinars in the political economy of COVID-19 series with speakers like Thomas Piketty, Stacey Mitchell, Julia Caché, Wendell Potter, and more. So please continue checking our website and sign, sign up for our newsletter. Back to this afternoon, we look forward to an engaging conversation. But before we begin, please allow me to briefly introduce our speakers. Angus Deaton is a senior scholar and the Dwight Eisenhower Professor of Economics and International Affairs Emeritus at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and the Economics Department at Princeton University. His main career research areas are in poverty, inequality, health, well-being, economic development, and randomized control trials. He is a fellow of the British Academy and honorary fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a fellow of Economic of an Econometric Society, among other accolades. He is the recipient of the 2015 Nobel Prize for Economics, and in 2016, he was made a Knight Bachelor of his service to economics and international affairs. Luigi Zingales is the uh, Robin McCormack Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance and Charles Harper Faculty Fellow at Booth. He is also the Faculty Director of the Stigler Center. His research and interests span from corporate governance to financial development and from political economy to the economic effects of culture, among others. He has also written several books and appears often in the media. And now, without further ado, I turn, I turn it over to our speakers. Thank you. Mona, thank you very much. And uh, it's a with great pleasure that I start with series with uh, the best person that could have started the series, not only for the great uh, 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 CV that he has, but most importantly, he was really a prescient in studying pandemics. And uh, he has pointed out to a silent pandemic or some epidemic that uh, has killed uh, actually many more people in this country than uh, uh, the uh, current uh, epidemic so far. And uh, this is the opioid epidemics that he described so aptly in his book with uh, Anne Kay. So um, Angus, can you give us a, a sort of what is the uh, punchline of your research uh, on, the, uh, on the topic of epidemics and opioid epidemics and how this is related and what you learned there is related to the current uh, 
COVID uh, epidemic. Thanks very much, Luigi. Can you all see this, the um, slides? I presume so. Great. So this is the cover of Anne's and my book, um, which was published on March the 17th. Um, one of the things I can tell you is that publishing a book about one epidemic in the middle of another one is a very bad idea. Not to mention the fact that Amazon will only deliver it for a month and all the bookstores in the world are closed. Um, but as you heard from Simone, um, do order it from your local bookstore, from the summary bookstore. Um, I'm going to talk about what I learned from Deaths of Despair that's relevant to the current COVID crisis. And it'll be pretty close to the crisis at times, but otherwise I want to go off in a couple of directions. Um, the um, background then, which comes from the book, this is a one slide summary of the book. Um, what we call deaths of despair are defined as suicides, deaths from drug overdoses and from alcoholic liver disease. All of these are self-inflicted in some sense, either quickly um, or slowly. There were 158,000 of those in 2018, which is the latest data we have. There were only 65,000 in 1995. And so this epidemic is the additional 100,000 deaths a year um, that come about from these deaths of despair. This is similar orders of magnitude to what similar numbers to what people are talking about for the COVID epidemic. This increase in deaths of despair is almost exclusively among Americans without a four-year college degree. It's both men and women, and it's predominantly among whites, white non-Hispanics. Um, very recently, since 2013, um, the overdoses have spread into the African-American community. That's to do with fentanyl. The book is a, a long book. Um, we work our way back from this epidemic to the faltering labor market for less educated workers in America with fewer jobs and lower earnings, fewer jobs and worse jobs in many cases, a lot of outsourcing, gig work, and so on. The two causes of that are very familiar and have been widely discussed, which are globalization and automation. But we argue in the book that the rising costs of what Adam Smith called absurd and oppressive, um, he called it about monopolies, we're calling it about the American healthcare system. So, Many people have argued that these deaths of despair are sort of an analogy for what will happen with the coronavirus. So the economy has been deliberately crashed with many job losses. Many of those are likely disproportionate among the less educated people. And the question is, will the crashing of the economy cause an increase in deaths of despair, perhaps worse than the disease itself? And we have the ultimate authority for this is President Trump. Um, this is one of his tweets. Um, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. And then the other two quotes come from Fox News. Um, you're going to lose more people by putting a country into a massive recession or depression. You're going to lose people. You're going to have suicides by the thousands. So the argument is that we should let up the social distancing as quickly as possible because otherwise we're gonna kill enormous numbers of people, maybe more people than the epidemic itself. So the cure would be worse than the disease. So what I'm gonna argue in the next slides is that suicides perhaps, but even that's not clear, but that overall mortality um, because of the recession is likely to decline, not increase. Now be very careful, I'm not saying that when you take COVID deaths into account, um, the overall mortality would go down. It's not a COVID mortality. It's the pure effect of recessions on all cause mortality. And this is simply not, it's not my work or our work. It's just that there are many papers out there from many countries and many time periods that find that all cause mortality falls in recessions, though indeed suicides do decrease. So let me just give you a little bit of evidence. Um, First of all, the deaths of despair in our book, we argue that it's to do with a slow, long running disintegration of working class lives from the 70s, for instance, now it's a 50 year um, process. And then we go to some pains in the book to show that these deaths are not affected by the business cycle. 
So for example, deaths of despair rose before the financial crisis, they rose during the financial crisis and after the financial crisis. In fact, here's a picture of um, um, blue is uh, men, women are in red, um, the less than the BA versus people with the BA. Um, and you can see this relentless rise from 92 um, up to 2018 of men without a BA um, and women without a BA going up more or less in parallel. These are deaths of despair for people aged 50, 54, but you can do it for other groups too. Um, you don't see anything for men without a BA. And if you look for the Great Recession, um, you'd have to know when it was, because it certainly doesn't show up um, in this graph. Um, more generally, all-cause mortality rates have tended to fall um, in economic bad times. So Greece and Spain, Spain had like a 40% unemployment rate after the financial crisis. Greece was the poster child for bad things happening with austerity and all the rest of it. Both of those did better than most other European countries in increasing life expectancy during the financial crisis. The Great Depression in the US is another example. In the very worst of the Great Depression, mortality rates were at local, did as well as they've done for many years at that time. Now, your intuition may be saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, this just can't be true. Bad people like money. Money makes them better off. When they're better off, they live longer. But if you think about it, it turns out that accidents of all sorts are low. Highway, highway accidents, construction accidents, and so on. And in fact, in the current epidemic, um, the New York City um, hospitals that were set up to take non-COVID patients are finding they have very few takers. And this is a lot of the reason. That's what usually fills the hospitals. Alcohol consumption goes down because people have less money. So especially binge drinking. Some papers argue that pollution, well, we know pollution goes down during recessions and the pollution matters for infant mortality. One of the more interesting mechanisms is that nursing homes and elder care in the US um, are staffed by low wage workers, um, basically minimum wage workers. Um, during a boom, it's much harder for those nursing homes to retain staff um, and to hire new staff. So as I said earlier, suicides do go up, but suicides are only 2% of total deaths. So it's a sort of suicide tail that one's arguing is waggling the mortality dog, and that's not usually going to happen. So, of course, you know, as with any evidence, you have to ask whether that evidence can be applied to where we are now. So, for instance, low wage workers right now may not be terribly keen to work in elder care homes, given what happened in Washington State, for example. Social isolation may make suicide rates work. Many people don't know, but there's a huge, what is called a suicide belt in the US that runs north south with the Rocky Mountains. And suicide rates in counties there may be five times what they are in the counties in New Jersey, for instance. So if social isolation is like this, if people feel very lonely, very dissociated from society, that may promote suicide. Um, as I'm sure you all know, we've all been receiving these very funny cartoons to keep our spirits up during the day. Many of them involve people killing each other who are put in social isolation, so perhaps there'll be more murders too. But it's not clear that that's true. And the kind of example would be in wartime, um, suicide rates tend to go down. And the argument there is that people form social solidarity um, against a common enemy. Um, and that social solidarity is the very opposite of social isolation. And so if leaders are capable of forging solidarity now in the face of the virus, um, it may happen. The best example I know of that is the Queen, who had a broadcast the other day, which rallied her people around her um, and with deep analogies to the Second World War and her first television broadcast, which was given um, 80 years ago. Um, which is pretty remarkable. All right, before I talk about the implications for healthcare, let us just say a little bit about healthcare in the US. Because for some reason, most people I don't think, think about it this way. Maybe they do. So, healthcare in the US is 18% of GDP. Um, the next highest is in Switzerland, 12 years. 
and Switzerland has four years more of life expectancy. So if you think life expectancy is the output of the healthcare sector, we're wasting 6% of GDP. That's 50% more than we spend on the military. That's just the waste. And other estimates of waste in the healthcare come up with that sort of number, about a trillion dollars a year. Here's a list of who pays. Employers pay for their employees, about a quarter of it, and other quarters paid by individuals directly and co-pays or uninsured pay to healthcare providers. And the other half is paid for by federal and state governments, and, and the states have to pay a lot of money for Medicaid. So if you think, focus on the employer plans for a minute, that's $20,000 for a family or $10,000 for an individual policy. For low wage workers, this is just not feasible. If you think of a company, a corporation that's employing someone who's say worth $25,000 for the firm, they don't care whether that's wages or whether it's healthcare and premiums, but it just can't support both a wage and a healthcare premium. So what firms do is they outsource those, they get, or they do without altogether. And large firms basically in the US no longer employ janitors, drivers, call cell operators, food service workers, or securities, the security workers. Those used to be good jobs in large corporations, starter jobs, if you like. You could start in the mailroom and finish up as the CEO. Now you can't start in the mailroom because there is no mailroom and the mailroom is handled by another company. State governments have been cutting state universities to pay for Medicaid. Um, the share of healthcare costs in state budget gone from 20 to 30% in a decade. And until COVID and the measures to deal with that, the future federal deficits are almost entirely for healthcare. And they sort of poisoned political debate in Washington for decades. Now, Adam Smith had this wonderful phrase about absurd and oppressive monopolies. You might wonder how this incredibly expensive and ineffective healthcare system actually manages to survive. Well, one of the ways it survives is it has five lobbyists for each member of Congress, and those lobbyists are incredibly effective. Opioid manufacturers targeted places where they knew there was despair and they made billions of dollars from addiction and overdoses. The Sackler family being the most famous, made $12 billion out of this. And Congress protected them by changing laws in their favor and muzzling the Drug Enforcement Agency. The, to me, the most, um, the, the wildest of these stories is that a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, the family-friendly healthcare company, was growing mutant opium poppies in Tasmania and it was those opium poppies that fueled the whole epidemic. No other country allows this. And this is directly a consequence of the power of this very powerful, very rich industries. Here's a list of other things, surprise medical bills, prescription drug benefits, lack of cost benefit analysis for procedures, no price controls, the fact that Medicare has to pay for drugs approved by the FDA at whatever prices the industry says, and the FDA is, I don't think a captured agency, but it's deeply influenced um, by the pharma industry. There's a huge amount of merging and monopoly among hospitals and monopsony against nurses. And, you know, the government is really not being doing anything about this. So um, here's healthcare and COVID-19 now. So there are two possibilities here. Um, and I have no idea which one is going to happen. Um, one is what I call the hero scenario in which healthcare is the hero, and the other one is healthcare is the villain. So the hero one is doctors and nurses become national heroes. We love them. There are wonderful scenes in Britain of people banging their pots and pans and cheering and singing outside their homes in honor of healthcare workers and nurses um, and so on. That could happen here. Pharma will come up with a vaccine and drugs um, and make them widely available at reasonable prices. But their lobbyists fought the affordability provision in the coronavirus bill. They got $3.1 billion for development of drugs and vaccines, but they want to be able to price them at whatever they can get. Hospitals may get together and in New York State, Andrew Cuomo, Governor Cuomo, has basically taken over all the hospitals in the city and in the state and coordinated them. So they're pooling resources um, and trying to work not as competitors, but as a unified unit. 
Who knows what's going to happen? How they're going to sort out who gets paid for what at the end of that. Testing is free, co-based, co-pays, and deductibles that we mean waived by many insurers. And the deaths are relatively small, and there'll be a full recovery for them. That's the hero scenario. So people think a year from now, boy, did our healthcare system serve as well. And we didn't have all the deaths in proportion they had in Italy, or we didn't have all the proportion that they had in the UK. Socialized medicine is a disaster. Look what our system did for us. But there's another story, which I think is equal, equally probable, which is the opposite of the above. So drugs are expensive and rationed by price. Pharma overreaches. Um, I think pharma, by and large, in recent years, has lost whatever moral compass they might have had. And <laughs> They will take this as an opportunity to charge very high prices for these drugs. Vaccines are hard to develop. We don't have a foolproof vaccine against the flu. There's no vaccine against SARS, um, for instance. So there may not be a vaccine for, ma for many years. The other thing is that many thousands could be left with very large bills that they cannot pay and destroy their credit for the rest of life. So they can never buy a car. They can never buy a house after that. Um, that could happen because there's no limit on surprise medical bills. Um, private equity firms have been buying up ER rooms and hospitals and buying up ambulance services. And then they, you, you go to a hospital that's in your insurance network and you still come home to a $30,000 bill or a $5,000 bill, surprise medical bills. Um, Congress, even though the American people hate those, um, something like 95% of people want rid of them, all Democrats, all Republicans, the lobbyists blocked reform in December last year. And it's completely bipartisan on this. The, the people who argued against the solutions that were out there ranged from Donna Shalala on the one hand um, to Mitch McCall um, on the other hand. These lobbyists are just very, very powerful. So if we're left with a mess a year from now, and there are lots of people dead and lots of people bankrupt and lots of people who don't fully recover from this, which is, could really happen. The anger could be sufficient to penetrate the protective cordon in Washington and eventually we get reform. That doesn't have to be, um, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about um, Medicare for all. Um, I'm talking about, um, any, any system that any other European country has. So let me finish by saying a few words about COVID-19 and inequality. One is, you have to be careful here because there's two sorts of inequalities going on. One is, will this widen income inequality, which is the first thing that people think when they're talking about inequality, and will the financial burden of this be unequal? The second is inequality of health outcomes so will different groups, social groups, die more or get sick more? And those are both relevant. I mean, you could get both whacked in your income and whacked in your, um, in your health. So there's a clear immediate effect, which I don't think is very controversial, that less educated Americans are either essential workers, which puts their lives at risk. Think of people working in the subway, grocery stores, delivery people, and so on or they're not essential, which puts the livelihood at risk. Think of waiters um, and so on. They will get money from the state. We don't know how effective that's gonna be or whether they can really get it through. But so where people like me or most of you are sitting in our comfortable homes doing pretty much what we always do and we're very worried about this, but it's not affecting either our health or our wallets. So either way, health inequality by education and income inequality by education or by income is likely to increase. We're already hearing stories that Blacks and Hispanics are disproportionately affected. Excess mortality rates seem to be roughly proportional to existing mortality rates. So the, the death rates from the COVID are about twice those for men, twice for men what they are for women, which is pretty much what ordinary mortality rates are. Pre-existing conditions raise mortality and morbidity is generally higher among the less educated anyway. It's in, the Hispanics are interesting because Hispanics have lower mortality rates than whites. And so you might well expect them to do better. Um, social distancing is harder for poorer people. It's close to impossible in 
developing countries like India and Africa. There are high rates of baseline mortality and lockdowns in India or South Africa are likely to remove livelihoods without improving health, especially in countries with very poor healthcare systems. It's much less clear in the long run. So globalization is likely to be partially reversed. Um, that was happening to some extent already. One story you could tell is that we've been sort of living high on the hog by getting richer through globalization, but incurring risks. That could mean that some offshore jobs will return. It means that we'll have, we'll onshore again, the production of key uh, materials and medicines. And that could both lower average income GDP, but also lower income inequality if there are more jobs for less skilled people. Healthcare reform to something else, there are many possible models, and this would remove the burden on less educated jobs and increase the supply of less education jobs. It would reduce the earnings of industrial industry professionals in pharma, hospital management, device manufacturers, and physicians. Those people get paid much less in other health systems around the world. And so those two things together, if we get a sensible health reform, could substantially reduce income inequality and reduce deaths of despair among less educated Americans. So that's all I have to say for the moment. I should warn you that there's a thunderstorm over my house and lights are flickering. So you may lose the screen, but I think for the time being, I'm okay and I will call in if that happens. Thank you very much, Angus. I think this was a, an amazing uh, summary of, uh, of your book with Anne and other key points. Let me start with a question that I have because uh, in the last few days we've been discussing a lot, we heard a lot of discussion about precisely the inequality and particularly the, the racial inequality in outcomes about the COVID epidemics. But in your book, you find that uh, uh, actually the ones who have been hit the most by the opioid epidemics are at least initially the white. Why the outcome was so different then? And uh, uh, what can uh, tell us about the, the system overall? Well, that's a, that's a really good question, and it's one we wrestled with a lot in the research leading up to the book. And actually, one of the best suggestions we got for looking at this, which turned out to be really right, came from President Obama. Um, once upon a time, Nobel laureates were invited to the White House and got the post to the president. And our paper had come out five days before that, and he'd read it from end to end in all the footnotes, and all he wanted to do was talk about the paper. And he said, you know, what you need to do is you need to go back to what happened in the black community in the 60s and 70s, and this happened to them first. So the story is it's not just affecting whites, it affected blacks 40, 50 years. And the story there is that the deindustrialization in the cities, the flee from the, the, the people fleeing from the center cities and causing social problems, the decline in marriage, the drug epidemic. And it's like you talk about whites today, but if you go back to the line of report, all the discussions that we heard then, that was about African Americans. So, one story you can tell is, is that, you know, American capitalism is set up today, needs less and less and more skills. And the lowest skills, less least educated people, where the African Americans come from the side of the city of and they were set first. Now, uh oh. So the thunderstorm might have an, an impact. So maybe now we're going to try with the phone. In in the meantime, uh, I want to say something that I actually uh, read. I don't know. I wanted to ask Angus what he thought about this. But one of the story I heard why it was hitting particularly white is because. Uh, uh, many doctors are more reluctant to prescribe opioids to black people. And so uh, in, for once, the racist that is diffused actually ended up helping uh, protecting uh, the, the black community from uh, using the opioids and in some sense uh, uh, leading to an abuse of the opioids. So um, this is a story I heard. I wanted uh, the expert to uh, confirm or disconfirm uh, this interpretation. 
So these are the challenges of uh, the COVID uh, world in which we have to cope also with this uh, uh, surprises, including the thunderstorm around uh, Princeton, New Jersey. That is not what uh, was uh, uh, expected, but anyway. Angus, are you back? Yeah, I'm back, but I may not be able to stay that way. I don't think I have any Wi-Fi and my phone depends on it. In the, in the meantime, let's continue with this. And so you were saying on the what Obama told you and then you analyze. And so the bottom line is, is what is your interpretation of why uh, the, the white are less affected, or well, more affected than black are less affected? Yeah, it's that the blacks got it first and it's now come for the less educated whites. You should also remember that black mortality rates, even though they've been doing well, at least until 2013, were still higher than white mortality rates. So it's simply that the white are catching up to some extent to uh, the uh, the black uh, standards, not the other way around. And and yes. why this is so pervasive uh, for less than college educated? What, what is so special about? Uh, is just economic condition or is something more? I think it's it starts with economic conditions, which is that you know less educated people have had a very hard time for a very long time, um, but. You know, it's not just wages. You don't kill yourself because your salary went down by 20% last month. But, you know, if you lose your community, if you lose the union that was part of your social life, if you don't go to church anymore, you know, and if your marriage is failing, and, and one of the most important things is the social literature that's talked about, you know, this division by education within the marriage market in which, you know, people like us go on having good marriages and living with our spouses and living with our children, whereas for less educated Americans, that's um, less and less happening. So people have unstable short-term marriages, uh, or not marriages, actually, because they're cohabitations and they have kids, and then you get into your 50s and you might have had two or three kids by two or three different people. And they're not living with you anymore and you don't even know with them. And it's that sort of thing that I think brings despair. Um, that your whole way of life, which is ultimately fueled by good jobs and good wages, but it's the destruction in the way of life and being thrown out of that, that in the end is bringing people down. Now, you mentioned in your talk, uh, India, and uh, you're not only a health expert, but also a development expert. And uh, if you were to be appointed uh, advisor to Modi, what would you tell Modi to do in the face of this uh, coming pandemic? Well, uh, it's very easy to criticize what he's done. And many of my friends are doing that. Um, I'm not sure what I would advise him to do. It's a really hard problem because we have no I, the number of deaths in India is small. Um, in South Africa, Ramaphosa imposed lockdown before there was a single death in, in the country. So, you know, we in the U.S., rich countries, have waited until there are many deaths before we did that. Um, these poor countries have done that much before, and they're destroying the livelihood of poor people, and it's not clear that they're protecting their health very much. Um, on the other hand, if I were their advisor and I said, well, don't have a lockdown, just let's go ahead, and there was a huge epidemic, but that's a terrible risk to take too. But I don't know how you protect poor people. It's very hard. Yeah, it's it's, it's really a, a hard problem. And uh, it's also a hard problem to some extent uh, in, in the United States. There's been a huge debate initially about what the right thing to do was. And I think that many, uh, including myself, have used some form of a cost-benefit analysis uh, for uh, this, uh, where we rely heavily on uh, some measure of the value of statistical life, which is something that uh, non-economists find hard to digest. Um, but uh, when we look at the uh, epidemics of uh, opioids and we look at how much uh, uh, the liable parties are paying uh, up in the recent trials for killing people, they pay numbers of, uh, that are much, much lower in terms of value of statistical life. So I would like your uh, expert opinion on how do you see the use of this concept and uh, what number, if we want to use it, what number we should use it, uh, at least for the United States? Well, you know, I'm not the right person to ask about that. I, I'm, I know you say that economists, not economists find this hard to swallow. 
I'm one of those economists who finds it very hard to swallow it too. Um, and I just have a very hard time. Um, you know, I, so I've always in my own work tried to avoid using it and so far succeeded. But, you know, I know that's not a really good answer because there are questions that require um, something like that. But just to give you an example, one of the things I find really hard here is, you know, the philosophers and the economists, and maybe the economists, I think, are in more agreement, but the philosophers are in no agreement whatsoever about whether it's better to save a life of an 80-year-old or a 60-year-old than it is to save a 40-year-old or to save a five-year-old. And there are very strong arguments for all of those. And to me, I think that's a totally intractable problem. And I, I mean, you know, we're supposed to be having a discussion here. So let me ask you the question. I mean, how do you deal with this when you think about cost-benefit analysis for this problem? So um, what I did was uh, a, a cop-out in the following sense that uh, I just uh, tried to show at the beginning that uh, the potential uh, number of deaths that uh, will occur in a, in a world without any restriction was so large that basically any reasonable value of statistical life uh, uh, suggested that uh, having some uh, uh, shelter-in-place right. rules made sense. So that was an easy way to do it. And, and you can do it with a so-called uh, senior discount for uh, elderly people. Uh, that right. uh, occasionally has been used in the literature. Now, as we know, the Environmental Protection Agency has been prohibited from doing that and is not right. very uh, uh, appealing. But uh, unfortunately, I've read enough uh, stories of uh, coming out of Italy where people, uh, healthcare workers were forced with a choice. Do you put on a respirator somebody who is 80 right. uh, or somebody who is uh, uh, 40 or 30? And, uh, and these choices are choices we don't like to do, but uh, in some situation we have to do. And, and I think that uh, uh, we need to some sense have some guidelines uh, for the people doing them. And, and I think that uh, fortunately things are getting better here in the United States. So we're not gonna be forced to many of those choices, but at some point we need to decide when we wanna take the risk of uh, reopening the economy. And, uh, uh, I don't think we are there anytime soon, but uh, eventually we're going to have to make some social calculation. And at the end of the day, we let people drive, even if driving kills people. Uh, and uh, if uh, yeah, but we, we, let them, we let them drive on grounds of freedom and other grounds. You see, I think that in most of these cases, even in the horrible triage that the Italian doctors have to do, there are other considerations which tend to dominate. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't really want to pursue this too hard because you can certainly argue with me in a corner on this one. And um, I will have to eventually give up my reluctance. But I just don't find the statistical life very helpful in nearly any of those calculations, for me at least. But that's my preference. No, it, it's very interesting because uh, we had a discussion with my co-host Kate Waldeck in, in the Capitalism podcast, and she took your position. She refused to discuss this trade-off because she thinks is the wrong approach to use. Uh, so I think that, yeah. uh, as you said, even among uh, economists and prestigious economists like you, there is uh, some uh, qualm about uh, uh, using this instrument. L let's right. move on, uh, and I soon are going to open up for the question, but let me ask one last question about uh, the healthcare industry. I imagine that uh, uh, you were appointed by the new president uh, to improve the healthcare industry, because we agree that uh, uh, ain't working in the United States. What would be the two or three um, key uh, decisions that you would push? I think there are two that are absolutely essential and that no healthcare, no humane, decent healthcare system in the world can work without. And, you know, Ken Arrow way back in 1962 or whenever it was, demonstrated pretty decisively that you know a free market competition cannot deliver health care in a socially acceptable way. I think that's pretty much his language. So there's two things you need to do. I mean, one is you have to make sure every single person is covered. And most countries do that by enrolling people at birth. So once you're born, 
you're in the system. And there's no issue of being in or out of the system. It's just part of your citizenship or part of your birth um, that you're part of the system. The second thing you need, and this is the hardest thing I think in America, is that you need cost control. Um, and without cost control of some sort, um, then um, you're going to um, be overrun the way we're overrun here. And, you know, the healthcare industry gets incredibly wealthy and then uses its money to protect itself by lobbying and rent seeking. And then you get on a spiral that gets worse and worse and worse. You've got to have um, cost control. And that's where, you know, you can get me again on this statistical value of life. I mean, in Britain, they have an agency called NICE, N-I-C-E, the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence. Um, and it subjects um, each new procedure or drug um, to or device um, to a cost-benefit analysis, and it has to yield um, so many qualities, um, you know, quality-adjusted life years per pound, um, or it doesn't get approved. And philosophers and others have taken those numbers apart. They're largely arbitrary. Um, you can quarrel about them forever, but they seem to do the job and maybe too well. And it may be that, you know, the National Health Service in, in the current crisis is um, not doing particularly well either, but it's not doing particularly well because it's been grossly underfunded for a long time. So that can happen too. But, you know, other than that, the cost control and universal coverage, you can choose the German system or the Swiss system or the Dutch system or the Taiwanese system. You know, you could have Medicare for all, you can have single pair, not single pair. There's lots of ways of doing it. Um, and all of them are better than what we have. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, lobbying and cost control, uh, Eric Zwig, a colleague, asked, uh, what, what, in your view, what is the role of doctors and the American Medical Association is in exac exacerbating the cost of healthcare in our system? Yes, they are. They are. They control access. Um, the AMA, together with some other bodies, is controlled by doctors. Um, get to control um, how many places there are in medical schools, and they get to control the terms on which foreign doctors can come to America. So they're restricting supply and they're increasing prices. So the average doctor gets paid about double what they get paid in Europe. Um, and the if you look at it's the biggest, I mean, it's a sort of arbitrary thing, but the top 1% of the income distribution and the top 1% of 1% of the income distribution is very well populated by physicians. Um, who have large practices and make a huge amount of money. So we have a question that uh, says, uh, how can you explain the low rates of COVID incidents in Mexico versus the United States? I think there are lots of puzzles like that. And um, if you, I don't think we understand the ideology of the disease well enough um, to predict that. Um, you know, there's been this dispute about face masks, for instance, and the Wall Street Journal had a piece yesterday that basically Hong Kong, which you really thought was an epicenter, um, and where everybody wears a face mask, has relatively few diseases, many fewer than you would expect. Um, and I think in the 1918 pandemic, too, from what I've read, there were many, many puzzling features that no one ever did explain. Um, you know, why some groups were more sensitive than others. So each virus interacts with the society into which it comes and gives results that we may not be able to explain because we don't understand the details of how it works or the social conditions under which, you know, it invades as it were. Now, one question uh, uh, touches on something you briefly discussed in your presentation, which is to what extent uh, the current epidemics, uh, epidemic will uh, increase dramatically the demand for universal insurance, uh, not only in the United States, but also in developing countries. And to what extent it will become irresistible, even in the United States, to have a, a, some form of Medicare for all? Well, I, I think it very much depends on which form the epidemic takes. And, 
you know, I hope the, the hospitals and the pharma companies realize that if they overreach, that's what's going to happen. So, so they're going to have to be very careful about these things, and there's some sense of that. I'm not sure I'm in favor of universal health care in poor countries. Um, health care delivery is a really hard thing everywhere in the world for the reasons that can I analyze. And, you know, if you think of a country like India, or even worse, you think somewhere like the Central African Republic, the government has no more ability, just does not have the capacity um, to regulate, uh, let alone run, um, health services, which is one of the reasons why healthcare is so difficult in those countries. So many of those countries have a nominal national health service, but, you know, it doesn't work because they don't have the capacity to deliver it. Um, so I think you have to take it each country by itself. I think also there'll be big ramifications in Britain, for example. So, you know, there's going to be a royal commission or whatever they have in Britain, which says, um, you know, why we're we so ill prepared for this who made mistakes and what can we do to, um, you know, to change this. I think there'll be a lot more precautionary behavior in the future. A lot of us, and I was as wrong as anyone on this, thought this could not happen. Um, and that the reason it happened in 1918 was as much to do with the Second World War as it was to do, sorry, the First World War, the end of the First World War and the devastation that it caused throughout the world and it did with the nature of the virus. And it, I now don't think that's true anymore. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are saying we've been warning you about this virus for years, but there were good reasons to be skeptical. Now, in... Uh... During the fight in World War II, uh, actually the British uh, started to promote uh, the, the welfare state and uh, yes. the beverage report was uh, produced during that time and uh, was an inspiration for people fighting that uh, the war, the world after the war would be a kind of a better world, world for everybody. Uh, why don't you see something like that happening now in, in, the, uh, in this what is a basically a war against uh, the COVID? Well, you might, um, but you know, I thought you were asking a slightly different question, which is why didn't it happen in America in 1945 or 1948? And they got close and they really talked about it. And the thing that stopped it in 1948, it's pretty clear was race. Um, and the South and the Southern senators made it absolutely clear that they had no interest whatsoever in a universal healthcare system that would look after blacks as well as whites. Um, and I think, you know, the whole history of welfare services, um, the welfare state in America is shot through with this poison of race relations um, forever. Now, I think that's still there to some extent. Um, I don't know whether it can be overcome. Let's hope so. So there is a question to say, do you feel that the capital markets have to be blamed for this situation? In particular, I'm referring to Raghu Rajan's book, Third Pillar, which says communities are always left behind by the regulators, legislators, and the capitalists. Also, yeah. what is the way out of this? I like that book a lot. I, I'm not sure. That it, um, I, I bring back some of these dying communities. Um, and, you know, some of the things that Anna and I talk about and what I talked about today was, you know, if there's a possibility that um, some jobs could be on short, some of those communities might come back. Um, I doubt it'll be a very big effect because, you know, a lot of jobs have been lost to automation, um, not to, you know, not to globalization um, per se. But I agree with um, Raghu, it's a great book. Um, and I think it's the loss of community as much as anything else that's behind deaths of despair. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know how to resurrect communities. And you know, the way the high tech modern world has sucked the most talented people out of many of those communities into a few high-tech, high-success, well-paid communities. I don't know how you can reverse that. So there is an interesting question, and it's very uh, unusual. Say, why in your book with uh, Anne Case, you did not conduct interviews with people 
in the suicide valve, for example, <laughs> not with people who could we thought suicide. Of, we, thought of, we thought about that. Um, and in fact, um, our book is in sort of a compliment to Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wudun's book that came out around the same time um, called Pipe Rope. And we actually thought of doing what they did, which is taking Anne's high school class from Vestal in upstate New York and finding out what had happened to them and telling the story of the epidemic through them. But, you know, the truth is we're not journalists. <laughs> we're not, um, you know, ethnographers. And we know people who are very, very much better at that than we are. And so we thought we should have a comparative advantage as we know how to handle big data sets. Um, we know how to check whether something's a few anecdotes or whether it's really there in the data. And so, you know, we decided we'd write about what we knew about it instead of what we didn't know about. The, the old uh, comparative advantage rule that uh, exactly. as economists we That's try true. to follow. Uh, sometimes we break it, and uh, generally when we break it, the result is not very good. So I, I understand completely. So here there is another <laughs> question. Um, what are the implications for productivity growth if we have an extended period of lockdown isolation? Will we see a large distribution effect with knowledge workers productivity increasing while unemployment uh, uh, will go up for the rest? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, <laughs> I think that's possible, but I, I, it's very hard on something like that. To, I don't have a model which helps inform me about you know what will happen in those situations. Um, you know, I've been very struck, for instance, with these Zoom meetings. How you know we can have this discussion and hundreds and hundreds of people can listen in at the same time. That technology was there before, but we didn't use it. So this will provide some sort of shock that will change the way we think about these things. And I think there's going to be a lot of that going on one way or another. Uh, another uh, viewers saying, is there data that shows a relationship between medical debt and an increase in death of despairs? And do we have any idea of how debt incurred by treatment of coronavirus will have an impact here? Yeah, no, I didn't. We didn't think of that partly because these deaths, you know, these are not prevented with better health care, um, or at least the opioids certainly could have been if the healthcare industry wasn't so busy killing us um, through the opioids. So, you know, these are not the sort of deaths that leave people with deaths. Um, the COVID deaths are a very different thing altogether because, you know, if you're like Boris Johnson. You know, he appears to be getting now. He's going to, but he's been in the intensive care unit for what three days, and he's probably got more to go. Think what his bill would be like if he were here in America. Now, of course, if he were president, he'd be covered by the health insurance that federal employees get. But even then, he might finish up with a bunch of surprise medical bills and have to declare himself bankrupt. I mean, it's not a completely crazy fantasy. Um. Another anonymous attendee to say, we have seen inequality not only at the country level, but also globally in the sense that medical supplies go to rich countries while developing countries are struggling to obtain supplies. Yeah. What do you think the world should do after this crisis to avoid uh, this link of inequality around the world? This kind of inequality around the world, sorry. So did we, did we lose Angus? Hello, Angus. Are you back? Did Did you hear the question about inequality? No, I, 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 I got it, and it didn't turn into a question, so I must have missed it. Uh, it was sorry. about about um, the, the fact that there is an inequality around the world, and what can you do to reduce this kind of inequality in the future? Could you? I'm sorry, we're a bit von swoggle here. Um, no, no, I under, understand. If they, I'm sitting in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But um, could you, um, the question is, there's a lot of inequality in the right in the world, and it's what can we do to make sure the medicines and medical supplies get to poorer countries? Yes. I, I'm pretty, I think that's not going to happen. I find it, I mean, it's clear there are places like the World Bank, um, maybe the WHO is not super effective. 
Um, maybe I think some of the UN agencies are trying to do that, but it's going to be really hard. I mean, they're going to have to compete against New York State or something, to, or Lombardia to get those um, at that equipment, and they're going to find it very difficult. But, but so if you were Modi, and uh, would you go down the path that Modi followed to basically stop the export of any medical supply uh, to richer countries? Um, I might do that. Presumably there's some price at which he'd relent. I mean, the trouble with the, the Indian situation is that there have only been about a couple of hundred deaths, you know, in a country of 1.4 billion people. Um, and one of my friends in India said to me, he said, most people he knew would accept a 1% increase in their death rate um, or one percentage point increase in their death rate, um, you know, not to lose their livelihoods. And so that's probably the route I go, which is you can see why he's stockpiling drugs. So uh, I, we're almost out of time. So I would like to ask you the, the one last question we try to ask everybody at this point, which is a pretty tricky one. This, uh, what grade would you give to the US administration in his response to the coronavirus, also compared to other countries like uh, South Korea, Germany, um, or even my own Italy? It's, it's, that's, uh, as you said, it's a really tricky question. Um, first of all, the U.S. is a federal system as far as public health is concerned. So even if Washington has been very spotty, which I think is a nice way of putting it, um, some of the states, um, like Cuomo, seems to be doing a pretty good job. And he's in the epicenter of the thing. So it's probably a good thing that um, Cuomo is in charge where there's so many deaths rather than DeSantis or whatever he's called in Florida, um, where some of my friends think is going to be a real disaster um, there. We don't really quite know why in South Korea. I have friends in South Korea and I've been talking to them. And some of the people have said, well, the experience with SARS prepared them, maybe. Um, they had test kits very quickly. Uh, maybe that helps them. I think maybe there's a lot of culture of wearing face masks. Maybe that helped a lot. But, you know, it comes back to that question as to why there's so few deaths in Mexico. And there's a lot that we don't know and we'll learn along the way. I think, though, just let me say one thing in favor of pro all of these governments who are handling this. It's a lot to ask any government to handle something like this that hasn't happened for 100 years. All right. So if you say, why didn't we have more ventilators? Well, why should we have all these ventilators lying around that we never use? Um, why don't we have more ICU rooms? Well, they're very expensive. And why should we have all these ICU rooms for something that many people don't think is ever going to happen? So I'm sure that when we look back, we'll find many things that should have been done better. But we have to remember that this was not uh, well, it, this is not like a business cycle. You know, it's not like there's a pandemic going to come every three or four years. Um, and so I think you have to cut governments a lot of slack um, on this. And also to emphasize once again, there's so much about this disease that is not known. There's this concept of viral load, for instance, which seems to be able to wreak havoc with a lot of these models. And it's just not understood. So we may never understand this. The, the 28... The, Sorry, the 1918 epidemic, I don't think, is fully understood yet. So who knows? Um, but I would not be too harsh on some of these comments. I'm, I'm glad you said that because the first time I heard about this concept of viral load, I thought that uh, I was completely stupid because I never heard that before. And um, it seems that it's becoming more important. And the idea is that... Uh, viruses are like uh, poison and the more you get the the more dangerous can be but uh, thank you very much angus for hanging on with us in under extreme circumstances and we prove that uh, uh, when there is a will there is a way thank you very much right. thank you this was fun and i wish you know my house were not dark but otherwise <laughs> thank you very much i enjoyed this and i look forward to talking to you again okay bye Likewise. bye, -bye.